This evening, I have the pleasure of introducing a great, great friend of mine. He is an Academy Award-winning screenwriter, a celebrated director and producer. He is a true storyteller. From his work on the television series Big Love, to his screenplay for star-studded films like J. Edgar, and his latest project, the Seattle-based story of the Barefoot Bandit. But nothing motivates him more than telling stories of this movement. By writing Milk, our guest tonight told a story that demanded telling, and he lifted up a new generation of LGBT advocates in the process. Even in the wake of Milk's incredible success, even with all the awards and new opportunities it brought, his success only intensified his commitment to fighting for equality. I came to know him best in the months following the passage of Proposition 8 in 2008. At first, we shared our disappointment and perhaps a bit of depression, but that disappointment quickly gave way to a drive to do something about it. We worked together to set up the American Foundation for Equal Rights and began the years-long process of challenging Prop 8 in the federal courts. That case now stands before the United States Supreme Court. You would think all of these things I just told you would have taken up most of his time, but no. He still managed to write a brilliant screenplay, dramatizing the events of the Prop 8 trial. Eight, the play, premiered in New York in 2011 and has featured cast that includes Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, and George Clooney. He's an inspiration to me, he's an inspiration to our movement, and he's never stopped telling our story. Let's take a look at those great moments from Lance's career in activism. I want to introduce the author of tonight's play. You all know him, Dustin Lance Black. Come on up. We need your help to finish this fight at the U.S. Supreme Court. Thank you. I think it's through these programs and us telling our stories and, and dispelling those myths and stereotypes that you know, the young people are starting to understand that you, you can't bully and, and you have to not just tolerate gay and lesbian kids, but really love them and accept them. When something happens, you can be aware and you can help others become aware immediately. Build that network. You need to make sure that if you hear something, you can send it to your network and, if, and, and that you're in a network so that you'll know everything that's going on. Because, man, we need the youth movement. The first time I heard of Harding Milk, I was coming up here to San Francisco to do theater. And I was closeted. I mean, I, it would be years, many, many years before I would come out. But I heard it, and it helped. Probably the next thing I saw was the documentary. One speech in it, and he says, somewhere out there, there's a kid from San Antonio, Texas, which is where I'm from, who's going to hear that a gay man was elected to public office, and it's going to give him hope. And I just remember losing it. You know, I just broke down crying because you know, I was very much that kid. It gave me the hope to live my life openly as who I am and that maybe even I could fall in love and one day get married. To all of the gay and lesbian kids out there tonight who have been told that they are less than by their churches or by the government or by their families, that you are beautiful, wonderful creatures of value. And that no matter what anyone tells you, God does love you and that very soon, I promise you, you will have equal rights federally across this great nation of ours. You know, it's not just the teasing and the direct violence. It's also being in a school where you hear, you know, gay being thrown around as like a derogatory adjective. And that's very, very common. It's very common that LGBT kids just might not want to stick out. They might not want to excel. Now is the time for the LGBT movement to follow in the footsteps of every successful civil rights movement in this great nation's history and to finally, at last, name our dream. Because if we want our freedom, we must be strong enough to fight for it. We must be strong enough to lay our bodies on the line when necessary and to make our voices heard. 
There is no longer any doubt in my heart that in our lifetimes, our dream will be reality and we will be free. I am so proud and honored to present HRC's Visibility Award to my great friend and my hero, Dustin Lance Black. Thanks for playing all those speeches. Now I guess I have to top myself. Interesting, right? I guess, uh, <clears throat> I guess there's probably at least a few of you, maybe even most of you, who are like, why did they bring up a California guy to Washington State to talk about a marriage equality ballot initiative? Aren't they the ones who screwed it up four years ago? And isn't this the guy who runs around the country talking about a federal strategy for marriage equality? Doesn't he know that Washington is a state? And it's true, it is. But you know what? I'm, I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about what I feel this vote, what November 6th means to this nation, and a lot about what November 6th in Washington state means to me personally. And I'll, I'll start by flashing back just a little bit. I'm going to jump around a bit and tell some stories. Um, that's what I do, try to do. And uh, I, I'm going to start about a week ago. I was in Texarkana, Texas, of all places. I was with my family, and we were there for sort of a sad occasion. And so we all went to this place called the Dixie Diner. And we all sat down, and this waitress came up, cute waitress, and she said, uh, you know, what do you want? And I said, comfort food. I want some fried chicken fried steak. I want some gravy on it. I want some black eyed peas and a lot of those rolls with butter and honey on it. And she just started laughing. She said, oh, sweetie, I wish you lived here. There's this girl I'd love to introduce you to. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> and I thought, boy, can't I just sit here and clog my arteries or do I have to come out now? in front of my 80-year-old uncle and this girl I've never met before. And that's, that's what we do, right? We're faced with that challenge daily because we're not always immediately identifiable. When I've had two or three cocktails after this speech, I will be immediately identifiable. <laughs> that's right. But until that, we have to come out. We have to come out all the time. We come out every single day, but you know, we always have that one story we call our coming out story, don't we? That one time when we had the most at stake, where we felt like we had the most to lose. And I don't tell mine often, in fact, almost never publicly, but I'll tell it to you tonight if you want to hear it. Um, all right, it was Christmas break from college in 1996, and I was going to fly home from L.A., from UCLA, to where my family was at the time in Virginia. And a little background on my family is I, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a Mormon home. And I grew up in a, in a Mormon home. Wow, that got cheers. That's never happened. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in a Mormon home, in a Mormon home way out in Texas. And that meant, yeah, you can cheer for Texas. Uh, that, meant, that meant that I had to go to the Randolph Ward. And this is a group of Mormons who meet, and they meet every single Sunday. And on special Sundays, this is the 80s. They would do this thing that at six years old I thought was amazing science fiction. They would bring down a screen and via, uh, via satellite they would beam in President Spencer W. Kimball, the president of the Mormon church. And I saw this white-haired man staring down at me and he said, next to the sin of murder comes the sin of sexual impurity, homosexuality. And I was six years old. And I was already into older men. I had a crush on that nine-year-old down the street. 
So I knew he was talking about me, and I was down there with all those sinners and those murderers and the rapists, all three foot, two inches of me at six years old. And to make matters worse, my good Mormon dad decided to run off, perhaps to find new wives, and left me with my mom to raise three boys alone. And a little about my mom, she had polio, so she's paralyzed. Braces and crutches to raise three small kids, never had a job, never drove a car, and the folks who volunteered to help her were the U.S. military. And they said, we will give you the skills. That's right. We can cheer for them. We will give you the skills to raise these three boys. And they did, but all of a sudden, my home was a Mormon military home out in Texas. Not the most accepting home, not the place to come out. So flash forward to 1996, and I'm on this plane, buckled up in the plane, ready to go home. And I'm going, gosh, what am I going to talk about at Christmas this year? Because a lot's happened since I was six years old. My mom remarried a Catholic Army soldier, and we moved to the Bay Area. And I discovered theater, and I discovered San Francisco. That's right. And I discovered, and I moved down to UCLA, and I started college down there, and I started to meet out gay and lesbian people, and guess what? They weren't evil. They didn't have horns. They didn't seem broken. They didn't even seem very depressed. And I came out. And I came out. And then, and I even had a crush this time on another older man. He was a grad student. He was 22. And, uh, and I was thinking about him as the plane landed, and I hadn't figured out what I'm going to talk about with my mom. And my stepdad picks me up from the airport in Washington, D.C. to drive through the woods down to Virginia, where my family was now. And I, I see my mom at the door, and she... She greets me with a giant hug, and all I'm thinking is, boy, I wonder if she would hug me if she knew who I really was. And standing right next to her is my big brother. Now, he is the toughest guy in our family. You know, all he does is watch cars go around in circles on NASCAR and kill animals, and, and he has that Megadeth poster and that Metallica poster, and he makes so much endless fun of my New Kids on the Block poster when I was a kid. <laughs> I covered it up with Paula Abdul, and that didn't work for him either. So we were, we were like oil and water, me and my brother. And I just thought, boy, I'm growing apart from these people I love, and I don't know that they'll ever love me for me. So, you know, I just opened presents as fast as I could and had Christmas dinner and mowed right through it and got up to my bedroom as quick as I could, closed the door and thought, boy, I did it. We didn't have to talk about anything. This is great. And then I heard this sound coming down the hallway, this click-clack sound. Click, clack, click, clack, click, clack, click, clack. I've heard it my whole life. It's my mom coming on her braces and crutches. She comes in, she opens the door, and she sits down in the corner of the bed, and she just starts talking. She starts talking about the news and about politics, what's going on in the world. That's what we've always done. I just had less and less and less to contribute over the years. And she, as an army woman now, she wants to talk about this thing that she just can't stand, this thing called don't ask, don't tell. But she couldn't stand it because it actually allowed some gay and lesbian people secretly to participate in the military. And she thought, these people are sick and wrong and broken. They should have no access. They shouldn't be allowed here at all. And as she went on and on and on, I could feel my cheeks getting wet. And I could feel the tears coming out of my eyes. And I wanted them to go back in so badly. I did not want to come out. I was not ready to come out. And my mom looked down to me, and she saw my wet cheeks. And she's a mom, she knew. She knew right then and there. And I looked in her eyes, and I could see the disappointment. And I could see the devastation that she felt that somehow she was responsible for breaking her child, and she didn't know how to fix me. And we didn't resolve it. We actually didn't resolve it at all. I went home. I flew home to Los Angeles, and I, 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 I didn't talk about it much. I, all I said to my friends was I was sort of wary about my mom coming in a few months for my college graduation. They were like, what's the problem? We'll just make some pasta and some salad and have a little dinner. And I was like, all right. And so then a few months later, I hear that same click-clack sound, click-clack, click-clack, click-clack. Here she comes up the hallway to my apartment. She comes in. My friends are all there. They've made salad. They've made pasta. And I'll admit to you right now, I completely copped out. I completely copped out. I didn't tell my friends that my mom was homophobic. I didn't tell her that she had any problem with me whatsoever. And I didn't tell my mom that most of my friends at this point were gay and lesbian. 
So she comes in, she sits down, they all start talking to her, serving her food, serving her pasta and salad, and I back into the kitchen, I'm going very, very uncomfortable, because all of a sudden I realize, because I've said nothing, because I went out, they assume that she loves her gay son. And they all start swarming around her, because she is like, she's like a saint. This is pre-Ellen, pre-Will and Grace. They're like, my God, she accepts her gay son. What a wonderful woman. I'm going to tell her my story. And they started to share their stories of coming out. They started to share their stories of feeling less than where they're from. They started to share the stories of who they were dating and the sex they were having. I'm, I'm horrified. And slowly, they're leaving, so I'm going to be left with this woman. And she, eventually, it's just she and I, and she pats the seat next to her, and she says, come here. And I could do, and I walk over to her, and, um, and she says, so I, I met your friends, and um, I like them. I said, okay, good, I like them too. And uh, she said, well, I, I, I actually had a long talk with that 22-year-old grad student. So, oh boy, okay. She's like, no, I, I like him, but I, I gotta say, he damn sure better start treating you better, and when he takes you out to dinner next, he ought to pay. <laughs> and I just, I felt a light inside of me I had never felt before in my entire life. I felt so empowered. I felt so strong, and as she wrapped her arms around me for the very first time in my life, I knew she loved me for me, and that change that change happened in one night because she met actual gay and lesbian people and she heard the details of their stories and of their struggle. And in one night, it dispelled the lies and the myths that she had heard for years, for decades, for generations in the military, in the South, and in the Mormon church. They vanished. She loved her gay son and understood gay and lesbian people. And I left that day and I graduated and I said, boy, if that's the power of our stories, that's what I'm dedicating my life to, is to telling gay and lesbian stories. So if it was a reality show, if it was a reality show, it was the gay episode. And if it was a TV movie, it was the Pedro Zamora story. And within 10 years, I was actually getting to tell the story of my great hero, Harvey Milk. But I was so goddamn proud of myself and so busy and proud of what we were doing and, and, and really working hard to make sure we did it right up there in San Francisco that I was ignoring everybody. I was ignoring everything, especially the phone calls from my big brother. And they were always troubling phone calls. He was the first to drink, first to smoke cigarettes, first to try drugs. He was always getting in trouble. And, uh, and I finally returned his phone call and I thought, boy, this will be a long conversation. Here we go. And I, I heard that sound in his voice, that broken sound, that sound that something was desperately wrong. And, uh, and I said, so bro, you know, what's up? Like, did you get a girl pregnant? And he said, no, no. You know Larry? I said, um, you know Larry? Larry's the one without the tooth and you like watching cars go around in circle and killing things together. And he said, yeah, yeah, Larry. And, and I said, uh, I said, uh, what's, what's up with Larry? And he said, well, Larry, um, Larry broke up with me. I said, what? He said, yeah, Larry, um, Larry dumped me. And uh, we were down in the basement about a year ago, and we were watching the races, and we were having a beer, and he leaned over and kissed me, and nothing in my life has ever felt so true. Nothing in my life has ever felt so right for me. And I love Larry, but Larry's afraid. He's so afraid that people are going to find out about us. He's so afraid of what's going to happen if people find out about us. So he says it can't happen anymore, and he ended it. And I was like, oh, I can handle this. And I, I whipped out every hope speech I had, every it gets better speech I had, and I gave it to him and gave it to him and gave it to him, and nothing I did could put hope in his voice. Nothing I did could give him that sense of liberation that I felt. And I felt like such a fool. Of course, of course, I felt liberated. I came out in California. I came out in a state where I know I won't lose my job. I know I won't lose my home. And because of that, people are coming out. And people are dispelling the myths 
and the stereotypes, and I did have a support structure. He grew up in Texas and lived in Virginia, where they put the fear of God in you that if you come out, you could lose your job, you could lose your home, and you most certainly will bring shame to your family. They have a lot to actually lose there, and they have a right to feel afraid. So a few uh, months later, I had the great honor of getting up on a very big stage at the Oscars, and I, uh, and I took that opportunity to say something. I said, you know what, I think it is time that the gay and lesbian movement start acting like a real civil rights movement, and that we take our fight to the federal government so that our wins in California and soon Washington will apply to my big brother. Now, that would have been a lot of hot air had I not stepped off that stage, and yes, I got a lot of grief, probably from some of you, about that new strategy. But I met a man named Chad Griffin. And Chad Griffin had a strategy, and Chad Griffin had a plan, and Chad Griffin has made it happen, and if you've been paying any attention to anything, you know we founded the American Foundation for Equal Rights, and we sued the state of California in federal court, saying that Proposition 8 is unconstitutional. And if you've been paying any attention, you know we've been winning. And you know that just a few months ago, we won again at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And they upheld the decision at the district court saying that gay and lesbian people deserve this fundamental right of recognition of this most basic, this very important relationship. And I, all I wanted to do in that celebratory moment, it wasn't just to hug all the people at A-Fair, it was to run to the phone and I wanted to call my big brother and I wanted to get on there and say, hey bro, my God, we're not there yet, but we're one step away. We are one step away from my win being your win. My freedom being your freedom. My liberation is yours. But I couldn't. Because a couple weeks earlier, my big brother lost his battle with cancer. And he died. And he will never know that feeling of freedom and liberation. He will never know that feeling that we have in our hearts. That freedom to be who he is and how God made him and why. Because he lived in Virginia and grew up in Texas. So why? Why is this federal strategy California here, Californian here in Washington State tonight? And I'll tell you why. It's because I want Texas to be free and I want Virginia to be equal. And if that is going to happen, Washington State has got to send a resounding message to this nation on November 6th. Because what does a win here mean? Let's talk for a second about what a win here means. When you win here, and you will on November 6th, you are sending a message to every single LGBT young person across this nation. And thanks to your support of HRC and the groundbreaking teen study, we know some sad truths. 63% of young LGBT people across this nation say they know they're going to have to leave their home and leave their hometown if they're ever going to experience happiness. And that's criminal. We know that LGBT young people are nine times more likely to attempt suicide than their straight brothers and sisters, and that's wrong. But when you win on November 6th, that means that all of these young LGBT people are going to wake up on the 7th, and guess what? They're going to log onto Facebook, they're going to look at CNN, they're going to look at their parents' paper, and it's going to say, Washington State voters believe in equality for all. <laughs> that their 
Their young lives matter. Their young love matters. Their future families matter and will be protected and respected. And it'll give them hope that there's a place they can go one day. But it'll give a whole lot of others the hope and the inspiration they need to stay in their hometown and fight and replicate what it is you're about to do here. But that's not the only message that's being sent. It's not just to the LGBT young people. There's another group of people who are watching this ballot measure closely. And they're in Washington, D.C., and they are called the U.S. Supreme Court Justices. Now, these justices, they do not live in a bubble. They read the newspapers. They watch the news. And I guarantee you they're paying particularly close attention to this race. Because, yeah, you know what? They don't want to be ten steps ahead. They want to be maybe two steps ahead. What they never want, ever, is to be behind the arc of history again. They do not want to be left behind the will of the people of this nation again when it comes to equality. They've seen that dark day in that court. So what matters isn't just the win, because I know you're going to get the win. The, what matters is also the percentage of the win. What matters, every single percentage point you win by here matters. Every single vote you get here matters. Every single percentage point and vote changes the narrative of this nation. And how do you get it? And how do you get those percentage points? And how do you get those votes? I hope I've given you one little example of it here. You never underestimate the power of your personal story. And you get out there over the next 51 days and you tell your personal story. You tell to your friends. You tell to your coworkers. You tell to the people you meet on the street. And by God, you tell it to that waitress who comes up to you and says, I've got a cute girl for you to meet. Because you can't just win here in Washington State on November 6th. I want you to win resoundingly. I want you to send a message of freedom to this entire nation. And why? Why? Because it is time we stop leaving any of our brothers and sisters behind. No more brothers and sisters from Utah to Texas to Virginia will ever be left behind again. So get out there and tell your personal stories and win this thing resoundingly on November 6th. Thank you very much.